Good morning. Let's all stand together as we get comfortable in our place of worship today. King David, the psalmist, said, I was glad when they said to me, let us go to the house of the Lord. And that's what we're excited about this morning. Let's go open up our service with prayer and thanks. Lord, we are glad today to sing and to praise you. We are glad to be in your presence, Lord. We thank you for Easter break that was uh, given to many to go away and to do different things. But as we come back, Lord, and get settled, we thank you that we can settle into your presence. We can come before your hearts, your presence with praise. Our hearts we lift up to you. We thank you, Lord, for all those that are a part of us that we can worship together with here as well as some maybe by the Internet and some that are even in other places around the world. We give you thanks, Lord. We are one body, and we lift up your name in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We have some different families there that have been traveling, and we, uh, we're excited to hear the Dawsons getting back. The Harrells are going to give us a report of what the Lord did through them in Colorado. And then hopefully next week or the week after, we're going to hear about Jason and Rachel's exciting news. So let's worship together. <laughs> He's healed in his name. I believe. I believe. I'll raise a
Put your hands together with us. Oh, where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. There is peace. There is love. There is joy. It is. It is for freedom that you set us free. It is for freedom that you set us free. I'm free.
what church does it just reminds you of what you've heard and just gets you reestablished in that truth amen just gives the devil a black eye amen help me lead this one i went to a conference in kalamazoo for a couple of days and this was this is one of the key songs that we got to worship with <laughs> Oh, 
God is greater, our God is stronger. God, you are higher than any other. Our God is healer, awesome and power. Our God, our God.
asking you to do today is just to come before him. Bring your heart before him. Just purely and simply, just like you were a nine-year-old child, a six-year-old child, just strip away everything else. Put your mind on hold for a bit. so tired you can't stand up. I can tell. single Give your own song of praise. Give your own heart. 
heart of love. Worship is all it is, is concentrating on something you can be thankful for. What's one thing, one thing you can say, Lord, thank you for that? And you just focus on that. There's a lot of other things going on in your life, but worship is just giving him the glory he deserves.
sometimes we make it more than it should be. We're so thankful today, sitting back here as Joe Bershad. And just about six or seven weeks ago, he went through a major accident. And God has just covered over him with goodness. Aren't you thankful for that? Where's Charlie at? Charlie had the rush burda in this week. They thought they were going to have to do some major work in there. And when they went in to see what it was, it was some scar tissue that had gotten in the way and given her irritation. And so instead of being in the hospital three, four days, she left the next day at 10 o'clock or 11 or something. God is good. Amen. It's, it's though a, a church family that's agreeing in prayer for each other. Some of you may get the emails about our prayer chain, and some of you may not, but get on that that list of emails that notifies us when people need prayer. Amen? And we we take, take it serious. There's so many my mind is flooding with. You heard about a gentleman that came on Easter and on Good Friday, and he was rushed in the hospital. They said he died twice. We interceded and believed they revived him, but he was still in intensive care. Mike's been seeing him continually at Troy Belmont. I went to go see him, and if I went by how it looked, he looked like his final days. It looked bad. So I had to decide. Do I go by what I see or go by what the word says? And I started to encourage his wife and started to pray and speak over him. And I know it wasn't just me. It was a lot of people. But as I concluded that time, just believing that this man's going to come up out of this and he is going to revive and God is going to be glorified through this miracle. At the end of the visit, it was like his whole body, he had a tube in his mouth, he couldn't even speak. He was just glazed up in some sedative up in the sky. But his body was just moving, saying, I am going to get out of here. Because I told him, you're going to get out of here, John. you got some days and years ahead of you. And he's out of the ICU. He's walking around. Glory to God. He's coming back. Praise the Lord. Does God still do miracles? I know I went to this conference and I heard some miracles I'd never heard before and my mind kicked in. And how many of you know that when your mind kicks in, it's usually not good? It means that you're going down a wrong path. My mind said, this is weird. These people are crazy. But God is still, I said to, to my friend, I said, I can't refute miracles. Miracles are still God's display on this planet, and they still happen. So I'm still a believer in them and believe for every one of us sustaining power of God to sustain us, bringing us miracles if we need it. Amen. Glory to God. I know there's more, but my mind is spacing right now. Um, we just want to welcome back Ann Grace from Florida. Could you welcome Ann right now? And when you see Ron and Mary Ann, give them a big hug. If you wonder where they've been, they went down south somewhere, and they've been trying to soak up some rays. Um, so they're back. We thought they'd be here this morning, but um, they've got a lot of helping jobs with the vet, with their, their son and daughter-in-law right now. Glory to God. God is good. As you're seated, I'm going to have Arden come up and share just for a minute of what he got to do in Colorado.
We're going to wait and dismiss the kids for a minute. Good morning. And my, my wife's actually up here. She can help me out, too. So you can come on up here, Dan. Well, then I'm going to stand down here, too. Okay. <laughs> well, uh, I, we do have actually a video to show you. And uh, before we do, you know, it's anything. Man, I just love this worship today. It's just so awesome. You know, there's this Christian song out that, uh, so I'll, Trey, I'll give you a chance to prep that video. So just get it, get it ready here. And so I'm, I'm so thankful for Christian music, and there's this one Christian music song, and there's the only lyrics I really remember is, is in some, and it's really a soulful tune. It says, uh, it's all about a man dying on the cross, raising from the dead, and doing what he said. And you know, when, God, when Jesus gets glorified, then, then God comes on the scene. It's awesome. So, and so we, we actually traveled, uh, before, before we do that, you know what, I, I rarely I get the mic, and uh, you know what? It's actually somebody's birthday like two days ago, and it happened to be in my oldest boy. And I know I'm stealing the show with this. Philip, come here, man. <laughs> All right. You know what I'm going to do? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put my arm around him over here. Come here, come here. Yeah, stand up. I'm not going to embarrass you, man. <laughs> You're being obedient, man. Right on. You know what? He just turned 16, and I'm, I'm so thankful for that. And, and uh, it, I still remember the day when I was holding him in my arms, and, and it was the first day that I was holding him in my arms, in my arms. And I said, Father God, I don't know how you did it, because I wouldn't do it. I couldn't, I couldn't give up my son like that. And uh, so now here he is, 16, serving God. Oh, man. Yeah. All right. Hope you don't mind that. Yeah, I just had to, I just had to be proud of my boy. And uh, all right, so, so last Sunday we weren't in church, but we were in full character. We flew into DIA, Denver International Airport, in Colorado for a purpose. Janie and I were invited to minister to kids at Free Life Church in Burlington, Colorado. Pastor Eric and Kirsten Kielborn were having some special message meetings with Mark and Trent Hankins, and they needed their kids to be ministered to. So we were delighted to be invited again. Their kids are Cole, Ethan, and Hannah. It was great to be able to spend time with them. The kids in Burlington heard from a guy named Low Price Lou, a salesman that always gets it wrong, and, and we sang some songs, and the kids love their worship time. And we would have some audio, but we got some audio technical difficulties. Now, this song here is actually a, a song of uh, where we're saying uh, it's Phil Joel, and I recommend you get the album, but it's awesome because it, it talks about fill me up till I overflow, fill me up till I overflow, fill me up till I overflow. And that's what we're doing when we're doing some of those motions there. That's uh, that's having fun with the kids, and we were we had such a great time, and we we actually it's great now because we actually got some pictures, and we're gonna see if we can send back a video and let them know because you know, most of the time when you're doing children's church, some of the parents they they don't know what's going on in in children's church, but Mark and Trina Hankins, if you know them, they're they're great ministers of God, and and. They came and just blessed the people. And so while they were actually having some ministry time, we had some ministry time too. And we've, we've been speaking in Children's Church about prayer. And so we said, you know what? Let, we need to bring that message of prayer out there to Burlington, Colorado. And so we, we did just that. I guess I got I to do the, the transition. So when we did go, we, we went with the prayer. Sorry, darling. You're awesome. <laughs> She's so patient. You know, we got here on time because of her, <laughs> if anybody ever wonders. All right, so anyway, Friday night, we got Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday. And thank you, Jesus. Man, the Lord is just, he's so good. And we always prep. 
But there are times where you prep and you go, well, Lord, what am I supposed to do with this? And, and he goes, well, you'll, you'll know. I'm like, well, can you tell me now? <laughs> but there are times where you just walk in and, and you go, oh, that's what we're supposed to do. And that's what happened. I knew I was supposed to make up some paper airplanes. And I, I can make paper airplanes in my sleep. And so I, I said, okay, Lord, we're going to do paper airplanes. But what are we going to do? And, and when we walked in, I knew what I needed to do. And I said, darn, I don't know what we're going to do. And so we're going to build on this prayer thing that we've been talking about. So we had a couple scriptures. Well, I'm usually the object lesson person. He gets the word to do, and, and I fill in the gaps. And so we had been teaching on 1 Peter 5, 7, cast all your worries and cares on him. And, you know, I know these are kids, but you need to stop and ask your kids what they worry about because they worry. It's not the same kind of worry that we may have of how am I going to pay this bill but they worry, and they have cares, and we need to learn to encourage them to cast those cares and worries. And so as I was teaching the kids, you know, we had about, we had between 18 and, you know, 11 all through the week, and, and I asked some of these kids, now these are kids that go to a spirit-filled church just like our kids do, and the worries and cares that these, you know, first through fifth graders have are real cares and concerns cares of, you know, what if my dad comes back and beats up my grandma and takes her to jail and won't let me see her anymore? You know, the cares of, you know, my mom left because she can't take care of us anymore. You know, these are cares and concerns of little kids who hear the word of God. You know, our kids, you know, we ask them too, and just be, just be sensitive to what your kids are caring about, you know, the cares and the worries that they need to cast over. And so when Arden did this airplane thing, the other scripture that I had done was Mark 6.6, 6, when you pray, go away by yourself. Now, Arden loves to do the fun things, and we made airplanes. And after making these airplanes, we had this group of 12 kids take their airplane and throw it just in the room, not, uh, not even a room as big as our children's church room back there. Throw your airplane, and you're going to sit, and you're going to cast those cares over to God right now. We had kindergarten up through sixth graders in there. They threw an airplane. If it was near somebody else, they threw it somewhere else. They knew to get by themselves. And we sat for a good 10 minutes. And you know the age range of kids. It's one minute for every year they are is their attention span. They sat for a good 10 minutes with their heads bowed, talking to Jesus, and casting those cares over that we had said out loud and their concerns to give to Jesus. We were amazed. We had never seen this happen. I mean, we've been doing this over 20 years now, and these 12 to 15 kids were on the floor casting their cares and worries over to Jesus. staff. Let's have all the kids stand up. All those going to Children's Church class today. We're blessed with these kids. And even these that are in nursery. We are excited about a couple that comes, the Uberas, that brought their little son. And he's a blast in nursery. And pretty soon, a couple of little girls are going to be in nursery. You might want to sign up for nursery. It's going to be some. Ushers, if you'd attend to the folks, if you need an envelope for your giving. Oops. 
After church today is our potluck luncheon. We encourage you to stick around and enjoy some food with us. Monday's Ladies Bible Study will not be here at this location. It will be at the Burchette's house. So we encourage you this week only we'll be having our ladies' ministry there. Wednesday, the youth will be here. The adults will be continuing to have their midweek. We had a, a real Holy Spirit-led Wednesday night. A lot of ministry went on this past Wednesday. It was awesome. So we encourage you to come out Wednesdays. And then Friday night is our burn service. And we love to have opportunity to worship. You might think, well, Pastor Ron, what can happen? Why would I spend my Friday night coming out to something like that? When you get in the atmosphere of the presence of God, let's just say anything can happen. And it's usually greater than what you planned. Because God gives, gets this opportunity where you set aside an evening just for him. And it's not the normal praise and worship set. It's not the normal service. It's you coming before him with your heart. And I encourage you Friday night to join us for this time. Let's pray over our giving. Father, I thank you for this opportunity that we have to, in our service today to continue our worship to you. You are to be praised. You are to be honored. And you are to be given the best that we have. And so we do that today. We give you our best. We give you our best singing. We give you our best attentiveness. We give you the energy of Sunday morning to get here. And as we give in our giving tangibly, we do that with our whole heart to honor you in Jesus' name. Amen. And I just want to bless and say thank you for those that give online we bless those gifts as well because those are being given into the work in the kingdom of God those are important as we just use a different avenue in which to give our resources to the Lord turn to John chapter 21 Brian I'm going to transition over to this one if that's okay Two, three, check. Test, how are we doing? Not yet. John chapter 21. I'd like to read. Are you getting there? Here we go. Verse 24 says, This is the disciple who testifies of these things and wrote these things, speaking of the apostle John. And we know that this is his testimony and that it is true. And there are also many other things that Jesus did, which if they were written one by one, I suppose that even the world itself could not contain the books that would be written. Lord, thank you for this chance to preach now and to preach and teach your word. I just want to give you praise and thanks that the revealing and the revelation of Scripture in our hearts brings life to us and brings such joy and freedom. And Lord, I just ask that today in this service, to every listening ear, we'd be brought into a place of freedom in you, in Jesus' name. Do you agree? Amen. We're just a few weeks past from Easter Sunday. And in the church calendar, when I say church calendar, it means that the events that we recognize throughout the year that are significant to each of us when the chronology of, of Jesus' life intertwines with our, our year and our weeks and months. And so we spend a few extra weeks sometimes at Christmas preparing for Christmas service, but at Easter time, 
I think it's important that we spend some extra time after Easter talking about things and events that took place because it's after the resurrection that the church was birthed. It's when we see the exciting things begin to take place. Really, it was pretty solemn up until that time, but when he rose from the dead, he brought us into something new and awesome. And so we spent last week talking about the last verse of the gospel. Have you ever thought about verse 25 is the last verse? Of course, we just, we have whatever they've given us, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. We don't know exactly if this was the last penned verse, but in our book, it looks like that. Was this an extreme exaggeration that if everything that Jesus did and said were written down, that all the books in the world could not contain it? My take on it is this. John saw God in the flesh. And when you see God in the flesh, it transcends human reasoning and calculation. You cannot put into books all that Jesus is. And so we went through that last week. And verse, uh, look one chapter back to chapter 20. It might be on the same page. It is in my Bible. Look at verse 30 of chapter 20. And truly Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in the book. So there was much more. But these are written that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. The one significant thing that John was speaking about mostly in his gospel was believing. Everything was about belief in Jesus and having life through that belief. Have you found life in Christ? I have, and it's an exciting life. It's not a mundane life. You might be tired this morning thinking, why did I come to church? That's just your flesh. Inside, your spirit is so excited. Your spirit is so alive. It is so vibrant and so hungry for God. We just have to train our flesh to coincide with what's going on in our spirit. Amen? We have to, to tell our flesh the way we should act. Tell our flesh the way we should live this life instead of being dictated by the flesh and by the mind. And so we just are continuing to learn that, and you're here because your spirit won out this morning. Amen? You're here because your spirit was greater in its ascendancy in your life than your flesh, and I'm glad you're here. So just for a few weeks in the month of April, as we position ourselves for the beginning of May, the first week of May, we have a guest speaker that you don't know about, and I'm pretty excited about. His name is Brad Shirley, and he's driving in from Pittsburgh because I told Brad, I said, before your life gets and turns a new chapter, I want you to come to Harvest and share about the chapter that was before. I want us to hear what God showed you in the process of months and years where you waited for the manifestation of your ministry and for the restoration of your ministry because Brad was in ministry at Zion Christian in Troy. And so I, I just asked him to pray about it and so we determined the first week of May for him to come. So I'm looking forward to that. I hope you're here. You're going to want to hear what he has to say. Until then, I just want to take three weeks and talk about post-resurrection truths. Last week was... The last verse of the Gospels, we called it His Majesty. This week, I'd like to speak about three visits, and that's the title of my message today. I'd like to share with you the three people that Jesus specifically went to after he was raised from the dead, because when we see what Jesus did in progressing toward these people in restoration, it'll give us a picture of the way his heart is toward us. And the first person I want to talk to you about, guess. Come on, just throw some names out. Good. Who else? Mary. Mary Magdalene. Who else? Peter. Come on, anybody else? Thomas. Eh? The men on the road. You're so biblically literate, it's ridiculous. 
Yes, Mary Magdalene, Thomas, and Peter. I want to speak about those three people. And the first person, Mark chapter 16 says, the first person Jesus went to was Mary Magdalene. And I want to talk to you for a few minutes about the importance of his priority in in meeting with her. Because there's something about love that everyone can sense. When you know somebody loves you, there's a connection you just want to be around. You ever been in a big crowd and you find one person that you like and love and you go to that person? I mean, there's all these thousands of people, but when you've got one friend, there's a connection there. I want you to know when Jesus was raised from the dead and he came out of that tomb, there was like this, this gravitational pull Mary did not want to leave his side. When Joseph of Arimathea took the body and put it in the tomb, guess who was there waiting and watching with a bunch of spices and oils? Mary Magdalene. Do you know when when the days went by where Jesus was in the tomb, you know who was waiting? Mary and a group of women. It was only proper for the first person. Matthew, excuse me, Mark 16 says, verse 9. Now when he arose early on the first day of the week, he appeared first, 16, 9. And then it says, the description of Mary Magdalene was, out of whom seven devils were cast. Now, the significance of that is spoken of later in in a different chapter in the Gospels. When Jesus says, those who have been forgiven of much, love much. Did you get that? Mary had such a love for Jesus that she was not going to leave him And even after, the Bible says that she would go to the grave. Turn to Luke Luke 23 now. Let's just, if you don't mind, I'm just going to wander around to different parts of the New Testament story, parts that we don't look at that much. Kind of tinker around, I guess they'd say. We talked about the fragrant oils in 23, Luke 23, 56. They followed, they watched where the body was laid. Verse 1 of chapter 24 says, Now on the first day of the week, very early in the morning, they and certain other women with them came to the tomb, bringing spices which they had prepared, but they found the stone rolled away from the tomb. And of course, you know what happens. They, they're perplexed. There's, the angel comes and things like that. But look at who it was. It was verse 10, Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Mary the mother of James, and other women with them who told these awesome things to the apostles. Now, the reason I bring these things up is because there's sometimes in the word of God, we we find that intertwined and inner inner spaced in the crevices of scripture are are little truths sometimes that can be pretty pretty awesome one of them has to do with joanna because joanna and a, a few other women were the main people that supported jesus's ministry luke chapter 8 says that you're in luke 23 go back to luke 8 real fast Luke 8 says that certain women, verse 2, who had been healed of evil spirits and infirmities, Mary Magdalene got seven demons cast out of her, and Joanna, the wife of Chusa, Herod Stewart, and Susanna, and many others provided for him from their substance. I don't think that you really love something until you start putting money toward it. Come on, what you love, you put money toward If you love vacationing, you put thousands. If you love vintage old cars, come on, 20,000 for an old Camaro. Whatever you love, you put cash toward. You love your wife? Put some cash. (laughs) Well, she knows I love her. 
she doesn't need that. Have you ever asked her? You know? <laughs> Come on. But isn't it the truth? People say this. They say whatever a person, you can tell a person is loved by their checkbook. You say, but Pastor Ron, I love the Lord. Well, these ladies, they showed it in tangible ways because it was valuable to them. He was valuable to them. So when you put the two together, guess who was hanging around the tomb? The ones who loved him greatly. So guess who he shows up to first? The ones who show the most love. Does the Lord know you love him? Like seven days a week? When I went to church, I loved the Lord about two hours a week back when I was first going to church. I mean, I had God. That's the reason that, that people stay away sometimes from church is because they have God, but only in a small little section compartment in their life. Yeah, I believe in God, and I might go to church for like once or twice a year, but I'm not giving him much more than that. My faith and love for him is just kind of meager. I'm not talking necessarily the people in this church because I see your faithfulness. I see your love. But the world can't handle because they don't love that much. When you love, you're looking to hear his word and get around God as much as you can. Amen? I just want to use Mary as a demonstration of someone who loved him. And let's look at one other verse before we go on from Mary. You were in Luke 8. Go to Luke 7 for a moment. I told you last week about in John there was a woman named Mary that poured oil, but different Bible commentaries speak that this is a different woman. It says in verse 37, this woman in the city who was a sinner, when she knew that Jesus sat at the table in the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster flask of fragrant oil, stood at his feet behind him weeping, and began to wash his feet with her tears, and wiped them with the hair of her head. And she kissed his feet and anointed them with fragrant oil. And the Pharisees had a problem with this, and they said, if you knew what manner of woman this was touching you, why would you let her? She's a sinner. And he said to Peter, Simon, I have something to say to you. And then he gives a parable about creditors. For those who are freely forgiven, freely love. I'll say it again. Those of you that are freely forgiven, freely love. When you know you're forgiven, it causes you to love even more. Yeah. Do you know you're forgiven today? Do you have a revelation of that? He washed you white as snow. And then Jesus said this, and I love this part. I love when Jesus teaches authoritatively. He says in verse 44, Do you see this woman? I entered your house. You gave me no water for my feet. I'm sure he had to calm his emotions because if it was me, I'd be like, come on. You gave me no water for my feet, but she's washed my feet with her tears and wiped them with the hair of her head. You gave me no kiss, but this woman has not ceased to kiss my feet since the time I came in. You didn't anoint my head with oil, but this woman has anointed my feet with, feet with oil. And I say to, to you, her sins, which are many, are forgiven, for she loved much. To whom little is forgiven, the same loves little. My point, Jesus knew when he was loved. Jesus knew when he felt love. Jesus knew when he felt honor. And I spoke of that last week. Too much, we don't honor the Jesus that we have in our life. We have not given him the honor he deserves. And John understood the honor. Mary understood. This woman understood the honor that if he's in your house, 
Glory to God. I think that's why Jesus met her first. Let's talk about Thomas. John chapter 20, let's go back there. In John 20, you know, a lot of us will always put a label on Thomas, won't we? He is doubting, doubting Thomas. Okay, where did we get that from? We got that from one verse, okay? How would you like one verse to label you the rest of eternity? How would you like one little snippet of time where you just had, you know, something was just not right in you and you got a label? But I want you to know that this is the same Thomas that for three and a half years walked with the master, was faithful to Jesus, loved his Lord. But at his death, had some problems. And the reason I say that is because we too can be like Thomas. We might for, for 15, 20 years be serving God, going to church. And then we hit up against something. We hit a wall. We hit a, a curb. Something just trips us up. You don't have to raise hands, but I would ask you to raise your hand if you've been there. And I know we have been there. Where something in our walk just gets whacked. That happened to, to John, excuse me, to Thomas. But Jesus didn't see him the way we see Thomas. Jesus said, This is a valuable man to me. He's one of mine. And in John chapter 20, I ask you to turn there. Turn to verse 24. Now Thomas, called the twin, one of the twelve, was not with them when Jesus came. The other disciples therefore said to him, we have seen the Lord. So Thomas makes that one, that one verse that everybody labeled him with. Unless I see his hands and the print of the nails and put my finger in the print of the nails and put my hand in his side. Oh, that's kind of gross. Put my hand in his side. I will not believe. And after eight days, the disciples went again inside, Thomas with them and Jesus. I love this. He came in and went right through the doors. The doors were shut and he says, He didn't say it. He just did it. Just his molecular structure changed, and it went through a door. I mean, any of you in there in science fiction, come on. You just you got to just imagine this is cool. <laughs> Nowadays, you can't go to a movie without some science fiction. I'm getting so tired of people doing unnatural things. Just somebody stand on the ground and battle somebody else without flying all over the place. Come on. Why is everybody going to have supernatural powers? <laughs> now, if it was Holy Ghost power, that'd be another thing. But Jesus, in the power of the Spirit, had a molecular change take place when he ascended to his Father. He now had a new body, amen? You understand that? And this new body can do new things, right? You're going to have a new body someday. Just thank God right there. You ought to just praise the Lord. You're going to have a new body someday. That body you have right now, you are going to shed it. All the trash that's... I mean, we got to be thankful and be good stewards of our body and honor the temple. But I, I can't wait the fact that I might have hair again. You just never know. <laughs> praise God. I don't know. You never know. I might have it before then. Some 20-year-old at, at this meeting, he lays his sweaty hand on my head and says, Lord, give this man some extra hair. Let it grow again. I'm like, okay. <laughs> hallelujah. I am not, I'm not faithless, but believing, Lord, but believing. <laughs> I mean, when a 20-year-old who's, who's on fire for God prays over you, just go, all right, whatever. Praise the Lord. So... Verse 27, he said to Thomas, he appears, he comes through the, through the doors, and the first person he looks for, hey, hey you, hey buddy, he personally says, come here, because I know how to restore you. 
I'll meet you right where you're at. If all you can believe me right now is in the sense realm and all that's going to bring you back is going to have to be something you can touch and feel, I'll go there. Come on. Put your fingers right here. Put your hand right here. Thomas answered. I'm sure he buckled and said, verse 28, my Lord and my God. Thomas, believe or because you've seen me, you believe, but blessed are those who have not seen and yet believe. Thomas was restored. Wherever we see Jesus demonstrating restoration, it gives us a picture of the way he comes to us. You might be in that pit right now. You might be having trouble with your faith, trouble with your doctrine, trouble with your church. I don't know. I only know what the Spirit of God tells me. But Jesus likes coming to people who have troubles. Jesus likes to come and restore folks who are struggling. So guess what he does after his resurrection? I mean, he could have been like, you know, Hollywood, like, Ooh, I'm back. Ooh, I'm just the man. Don't get near me. You know how people are who are movie stars. You just, you got an entourage around them. You can't get near them. Jesus could have been Hollywood, but instead he was touchable. And he went and he said, I've, I've been connected to Mary. I want to reconnect. I'm connected to Thomas. I want to reconnect and restore him. In a few minutes, he's going to reconnect with Peter in the three visits after his resurrection. He saw him as valuable. He sees you as valuable. I didn't get many amens. I'm going to say that again. He sees you. If you can't amen, at least inside, give an affirmation that he sees you as valuable. And he wants to restore you. Do you know, that I love the fact that that's all it took, Thomas. Thomas didn't need anything else. It's like from, from black to white. It's just like he just went in an about face, 180 degrees. And the first thing he did after the ascension was he, he sought the Lord. And church history says that after Thomas sought the Lord as to where to go, as they dispersed and began to preach, he went to India and North Africa, places where there were savages and he, he built up new Christian communities and got people saved, filled with the Holy Spirit. On the first Sunday after Easter every year in India, right now in 2013, they have a celebration for the, the celebration of St. Thomas in India right now. 2,000 years ago, I'd love for me to, my life to do one thing that 2,000 years ago somebody's recognizing. That'd be cool. 2,000 years later, they're still celebrating calling him St. Thomas because he came to North Africa and India to preach the gospel to them. Some legend has it that, that when they tried to burn him, he wouldn't burn. So while he was in this furnace of flames and he wasn't burning they shot him with spears and arrows to kill him he was a martyr for his lord all because jesus said i want you thomas and whatever it takes i'm going to get you back i want you to know the lord is that personal about you he knows everything about you he knows what makes you tick and he wants you back if you're gone he wants you back and he will go the through the highways and byways and through the hedges to find you. And in the perfect time when he comes to you, it is going to be so personal that you're going to say it had to be the Lord because only the Lord knew that. And I'm going to watch from a distance at how he brings you back because I know there's some of you that are struggling. And there's all I can do to preach the word and pray. I'm just going to keep watching because I know he's drawing you lovingly back to himself. He will capture your heart again. Amen.
All right, let's go to Peter. John 21. It's all right there. In John 21, we we find that Peter has this backslidden condition. After these things, verse 1, he showed himself again to the disciples to see the various. In the way, he showed himself to Simon Peter, Thomas called the twin, Nathaniel and Cana and Galilee, sons of Zebedee, and two other of his disciples were together. Simon Peter said this profound statement. He says to his buddies, I'm going fishing. It doesn't just, for those of you that have studied, this is not just a field trip. This is him saying, I'm done. I am done with Jesus. I'm going back to my old occupation. I'm going to go back to what I used to do. And how many of you know that Jesus had another plan <laughs> for old Peter? So they went out and immediately got into the boat, and the night, that night they caught nothing. This is sounding similar to other times when people get in the flesh. They catch nothing. <laughs> Their business does not prosper like they had hoped. But when the morning had now come, Jesus stood on the shore, yet the disciples did not know it was Jesus. And Jesus said to them, Children, have you any food? They said, No. He says, Cast the net on the right side of the boat, and you'll find some. To me, that's a little bit disrespecting a professional fisherman. I mean, he, Jesus just does this. He, he gets into our world where we're supposed to know something, and he trumps it. I mean, Vince knows some cement like the back of his hand. Brian knows parts and service like the back of his hand, and so does Ken Nagerson. You guys who are in trades, you know stuff that the rest of us don't know. Ladies in here that have a careers, there's things that you have learned and are developed in. But when Jesus comes into your world, he just trumps what you know. And he says, if you'll do it my way, I'll get you a plentiful catch. So he tells Peter this. And so Jesus, of course, has the power within his words to create. And they cast the net and fish just surround that boat on that side at least. And they catch a multitude. What does this remind you of? The first time Peter got called. So is there a coincidence here, or is this a divine reasoning of why Jesus, who knew Peter so personally, would come and say, Peter, I want to jog your memory here. What is with that spot? (laughs) I guess you guys need it more today. (laughs) Oh, it's happening again. I'm going to stand right here. Um, He jogs Peter's memory with the calling of his life that took place around a boat and fish and a miracle. Luke Luke chapter 5. A boat, a fish, and miracle was what called Peter into the ministry. Right? So what does Jesus do to call him back to ministry? A boat and a fish And an amazing catch. Restoration is awesome when God decides to come back to us. In verse 15 and 6 and 17, he does even more. When he'd eaten breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me more than these? And he said, yes, Lord, you know I love you. And he said, feed my lambs. Verse 16, he said to them a second time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? And he said to him, yes, Lord, you know I love you. He said, tend my sheep. He said to him a third time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? And Peter now is getting grieved because he did it three times saying, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. Why would there be three questions? Because just a few days before, guess what Peter did three times? <laughs> I just think that it's amazing how personal the Lord can be. 
The Lord, lo- I'll just say it this way, the Lord knows our love language. There's certain things that you could do for me and it won't appear to be that much love because it's not my language. But there's certain other things that the Lord does for me and I go, oh, he loves me because that's what excites me. And the Lord knows Peter and the Lord knows you and the Lord knows all of us and he knows what gets us back because he comes to us in the language of love that we will understand. Do you know some people, I'm going to get into this on Mother's Day. I'm kind of giving away my Mother's Day message, but some people, they need words. Other people need gifts, and that does something special in their heart when somebody gives them a gift. And there's five or six things that we respond to. Some people, it's just touch. If you are affectionate, that shows them that you love. And if you withhold affection, they feel horrible. See, these type of things, the Lord knows. And I hear some of you say that sometimes the Lord speaks to your heart and you know it's him. And that's the love language that you respond to. Peter knew that this was the love of Christ, the love that he needed to get his heart back. And let's look at one last verse, verse 18 and 19. Most assuredly, I say to you, Peter, when you were younger, you girded yourself and walked where you wished. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands and another will gird you and carry you where you do not wish. This he spoke, signifying by what death he would glorify God When he had spoken this, he said to him, follow me. Peter was given restoration by the Lord in different ways in the book of John, chapter 21. And the way that Jesus restored Peter back to ministry was reminding him of his calling. Sometimes the one thing that the Lord needs to do in us is to remind us that you have a purpose. People flounder and backslidden for years and years until the Lord knocks on their heart and says, when are you going to do what I've called you to do? When are you going to take up that anointing that's on your life? When are you going to fulfill the purposes for which I made you? Don't squander any more time. Don't squander any more years. Find out what I've created you to do and start to do it. When God gives us purpose, it excites us. We say, yes, I have a reason for being here. You know how many people are in our neighborhoods right now squandering years because they don't know their calling? They don't know their purpose? That's our job is to give them the ministry of reconciliation that reconciles them back to God. And once they get back to God, you know what he whispers in their ear? You, buddy, have a purpose. When I was at the hospital and John was laying there with a big tube in his mouth and he's glazed eyed, I began to speak to him about his purpose. I said, John, you've got a purpose for why you're here. You've got to fulfill it. There's more years ahead. And his whole body just starts shaking and quivering because his spirit heard what I was saying. Do your, does your spirit hear what I'm saying today? You've got a purpose. There's things God has put in you, and they need to be tapped. Or else he'll let somebody else take that and fulfill it. Because it's going to get done. But you'll still be responsible for what he put on your heart and what he put in your life. If you disobey, he'll find somebody else. Amen. I don't know if pastoring in Romeo was God's first choice. I don't know how many other guys didn't do it in the way that I'm doing it. I know that I heard reports that different prayer people and prayer women were praying for a full gospel churches like what we're seeing in Pastor Waters' church and our church to come to Romeo. There might have been a whole bunch of people that didn't obey, but I knew that the Lord was calling us to North Macomb. I am excited.
excited about fulfilling his purpose. And you know what? When you hook arms together with us, we are doing this together, affecting this community for the Lord. I'm excited about what he has for not only my life, I'm excited about the work of the kingdom he has through you and through these young people that we see being raised up. God has some special things. So I'll close with this. Has God revealed himself personally to you? Do you know him personally? Do you walk with him and talk with him daily? That's the type of relationship he wants. And if you ever stray, if you ever backslide, if you ever wander, he knows your language, and he's coming back for you. Just don't run so fast that he's, <laughs> I know he can catch you, but sometimes we run so hard away from him that there's nothing he can do because he's given you a free will. If you want to run, you can run, but he wants you back. And he wants you all in. You know what I mean by that? You ever been places where you're not all there? You ever been to church and you're not all there? I see some of you fading off to sleep on me this morning. You're at church, but you're not all there. He wants you all in. All in. And I'm, I'm encouraging you young people. If you see a populace of your group that's not all in, that doesn't mean you shouldn't be all in. You get all in. Don't worry about them. My youth group was not on fire for the Lord. My youth group were back row sitters. So guess what I had to do? I had to break free from my youth group and get all in because that's what he was calling of me. Amen? Let's bow our heads. Father, I thank you for this time and your word, and thank you for the restoration that you showed us through three visits after your resurrection. Thank you for the callings that Mary had, the love you had for her and what her purposes were as we see also in Thomas, Peter, and all the apostles. They all, many of them, gave their lives as martyrs because of their love for you. Lord, I thank you for the loving kindness that you surround us with compassion you have for us. Lord, I could ask for a raise of hands of those that are in this state or that state, but I, I believe that you're already dealing with and restoring just through this message. And we're going to keep it at that. I trust that you know and you love and you're going to continue to care for us personally in Jesus' name. Amen. I hope you feel his love today. I hope he, you know that he cares about you so affectionately and cares about whatever you're going through. I, I sometimes hear what people are going through and sometimes I don't. I wish I could have a hotline to everything that's going on in your lives. I have to pray and seek God for that. But I want you to know the Lord is there 24-7. Amen. Let's all stand together. As is custom with our church, if there's other needs that you came into a Sunday morning service with, and you just need somebody to grab a hand with and to pray for you, we like to do that at the end and let you meet us up here for that time. Glory to God. I encourage you to join us for lunch after church today. Grab hands with somebody next to you. Thank you, Jesus. Lord, you said you give more grace. And we just ask for your grace today. Grace to, to serve, grace to love you, grace to overcome things in our life. We thank you for the empowerment that comes through the grace of God. And we just ask that your grace would sustain us in each one of these and as that gentleman is trying to fully recover out of that hospital bed in Troy Beaumont, we pray grace and healing upon him as well. 
and Berta as she continues in her healing. We give you praise and thanks in Jesus' name. Amen. You're dismissed. God bless.